All right, Dr. Jay Shetland with you today, and we are interviewing Dr. Andrew Hatch in Portugal. He's a fantastic chiropractic physician. He's been practicing in Portugal for 26 years, uh, helps serve and lead in the European environment for helping doctors improve their practice and serve more patients. He's been serving on the board for Parker College of Chiropractic for forever, and he's gone on and he's gotten his, his MBA and his PhD, and I want to turn over the time to Dr. Uh, Hatch. I'm going to just put up here the Pina Palace from Portugal as my backdrop, so you're not looking at our little office here. And uh, Beautiful building. Isn't that a great place? Oh my gosh, just the memories of taking the family there is fantastic. So let me turn it over to you, Dr. Hatch, and if you don't mind just uh, shrinking your, turning off your video so that we have a better audio stream, then we'll, we'll run with it. All right, thank you. So why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about why you got your PhD in well, musculoskeletal stuff and just run well, with it. First of all, yeah, I, got, I, I did an MBA and a PhD, both based around uh, musculoskeletal. And the, the whole objective was, it, was to prove the efficacy of chiropractic care over other methods for treating musculoskeletal conditions in the workplace. Uh, so the, starting out in... Uh, in the on-site corporate business is what really motivated me to do this. Now, what inspired me after, previously was sitting on the board of Parker. So I served on the board at Parker for nine years and, and uh, during that time, uh, we learned a lot. It was a huge learning curve. It was an amazing experience. And I was there during that time of transition between Chiro uh, Parker College of Chiropractic to Parker University. Mm -hmm. um, and on that time, I was the chair of the academics committee, and I served as the, the vice chair of the board. And in that time, learned so much about the academics behind uh, running a university and about creating and developing programs that can be most beneficial and high demand for students around the world, and, and mainly in the United States, which was Parker's target. At that same time, I was getting nudged by some of the other board members to perhaps think about uh, becoming president as the school advances into the university level. Um, so for that, I decided to get an MBA and I chose an MBA in leadership and sustainability. And I chose a thesis uh, on musculoskeletal awareness and knowledge among managers and corporations. Because in 2007, I launched an on-site corporate clinics within within some companies one was Accenture Consulting um, and after a couple of years they wanted some data to justify uh, what is it you're doing and what's your impact and what are your benefits well I, I really didn't know uh, decided to do a kind of an amateur research study because I wasn't a researcher at the time um, and we proved that they we decreased absenteeism we decreased the dependency on pain medications uh, we increased people's productivity, but we only did that through questionnaire surveys and not through the scientific method. Mm -hmm. um, so pursuing a master's degree, I learned more about the scientific method. I learned more about managing, management skills. What is, what is it that managers focus on? What do they need to do? What do, how do they make decisions based on return on investment, based on employee satisfaction, organizational behavior? There's so many factors involved that I wasn't aware of. And doing an MBA really opened my eyes to just what a different planet it is to be in the corporate world versus our, our little clinics, you know. So, um, so after completing that MBA, it, it was fascinating because I questioned, I traveled around the world, I traveled around the US, Canada, UK, um, and did interviews with uh, multiple managers that were in charge of employee health. So uh, HR directors, human resource directors, and uh, what would you call them? I suppose benefits directors. Okay. Um, and interviewed the Americans and the UK and the Canadians. Each was very fascinating, um, fascinating results. So I basically questioned all of them as what is your awareness of musculoskeletal conditions, its impact on employee health and productivity and costs, and what solutions do you have? Well, the conclusions to this thesis were, show, which showed very clearly that the United States managers had very high awareness about musculoskeletal conditions primarily because they are the the they carry the burden of the cost of treating musculoskeletal in the workplace Interesting. they didn't seem too concerned about the absenteeism impact but only about the direct costs hmm. 
and they didn't have any real on-site solutions to speak of. So out of uh, 40 long interviews with people, very few Americans uh, had any, any solutions for on-site. In the UK, on the contrary, in the United Kingdom, these managers didn't care, didn't have any knowledge or interest in musculoskeletal, yet there was an abundance of solutions for, for musculoskeletal conditions in the workplace available because the, the UK government sponsored uh, a lot of research on MSD and the impact on productivity. They don't have, they weren't concerned about the direct cost. They're more concerned about global competitiveness. So their focus was, are these people being productive or not? And are they missing work days? And can we get them back to work faster? You know, that's, so that's the US fascinating. Was completely different. That's yeah. fascinating in the point that they're trying to be proactive where the re- right. US model is reactive. Uh, oh, exactly. it's going to cost us. So what's this going to cost us? How do we avoid these costs? And there's how do we be more productive and, and, and give more to the world and, and, and have more gains? That's an interesting total opposite paradigm from the two <laughs> places. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, that, that's excellent. That's a, a very astute observation, Dr. J, because that's uh, it's exactly the, the conclusions that we, <laughs> we came up with is that mm. uh, the country that needs it the most has the least uh, solutions and uh, the they have high awareness, but no solutions, and they don't really value the on-site solution. Whereas the Europeans, uh, the, Euro- the, uh, the corporations do not carry the burden of the healthcare costs, but they only carry the burden in, the, in lost productivity and in, in absenteeism. So that, when I completed my MBA and completed this thesis, my um, director said, why don't you go on with this with, as a PhD, because the work you've done is more on the level of PhD than, than an MBA. So I extended it and we did a, a giant survey. I did a PhD again in management, not in chiropractic and not in neuroscience, but in management. Because mm-hmm. the reason I chose management, one, it would give me the skills required to, to run a school. But two, we need to demonstrate the economic superiority and the economic benefits of chiropractic care, not just the scientific and clinical. Because uh, Decisions, the, the final decision makers, it comes down to money. You can have the greatest neurological response. You can have great scientific evidence that uh, treatment A works better than treatment B, but the guy who makes the decision or the gal that makes the decision in the business says, how much is this gonna cost? And is it, what's my return on investment going to be? They really don't care about the clinical science behind chiropractic versus physical therapy, versus osteopathy. They don't care. And they don't know, and they don't, it's not their job to care. What they care for is results. And they mean not just clinical results, but financial results and impacts, because they have a fiduciary responsibility to shareholders, which means increased profits and retained earnings. Mm-hmm. So it's important that companies make more money and can distribute more to their shareholders. That's their primary concern. Yeah, that's, their, so, that's what they're in business with. Okay. Absenteeism, clearly visible and measurable, is supposed to be a company's biggest productivity problem. But what about the employees who, though present, are clearly too unhealthy to achieve full productivity? This is known as presenteeism, and productivity losses caused by it are much more difficult to estimate and control. Whether your employees are present or absent, it is imperative that they are fit and healthy enough to be unquestionably productive. The two main causes of ill health at a workplace are stress and poor posture. While stress can lead to heart diseases, stroke and obesity, poor posture, if unchecked, can also lead to a host of other serious problems like neck and lower back pain. Back pain, in fact, is one of the most expensive and serious global epidemics, affecting over 25 million people between the ages of 20 and 50 in USA alone and hundreds of millions of people worldwide. This kind of lifestyle has accelerated the process of progression towards regression. But now, not anymore. Introducing Global Wellness, a company that successfully installs and operates wellness clinics in various organizations. Their four-step process includes posture exercise, spinal treatment using advanced computerized technology, therapy, 
and health counselling. The patients are physically involved in the process and that only takes 15 minutes of their time away from their desk. With 24-7 back office support, Global Wellness handles all the bookings, scheduling, exercise and postural correction plans and one-on-one -on -one counselling and coaching services. This process empowers the employees, leading to greater productivity and job satisfaction. So contact Global Wellness and save millions per year in medical costs and productivity losses. Global Wellness. To be well is a lifestyle. Yeah. yeah. And we as physicians don't really think in those terms. We think about service. We think about clinical. We think, oh, how can we help our people? How can we get them better, faster? Um, we don't really think about the economic impact we're having or that this musculoskeletal problem is having on that person's life. So it's not only uh, impacting their work productivity, but it's impact, impacting their family life, every, every other aspect of their life. When someone gets a herniated disc or they, you could, you name it, Dr. J, <laughs> we yeah, see them all. Yeah. Um, so anyway, not to drag on too much on this point, but the PhD was, was specifically designed as an economic study. So we, have three on-site clinics in three very large corporations in the banking banking sector, the the energy sector, and the consulting sector. And we took 300 people from each of these companies that were under care. We we uh, evaluated each and every one of them. We took X-rays of them. So if this if your audience is primarily chiropractors, is, who is the audience for this? I think this it's going to be pretty open. It's going to be. It's going to be chiropractors, but it's going to be a lot of general population that's looking for answers for better health, immunity, fighting yeah. cancer. I mean, we have different episodes on different specialties. Oh, well, that's great. That's great because everybody who's listening probably is doing what I'm doing, sitting in front of a computer right now. And, and, right. and one of the results of sitting in front of that computer is you get something called forward head posture or forward head carriage. And often that's associated with a reduction in cervical curve of the neck. And we call that the arc of life. So that's the most important curve in your neck. And I found a direct correlation with this lack of cervical curve and lost productivity uh, and how much that costs a corporation. So it's a direct statistically significant uh, impact on, on your health and on your productivity. So uh, we found correlations between, between poor posture, between the, the musculoskeletal condition itself and how it affects many aspects of, of your productivity. Um, so again, it was a way to do follow scientific method, publish in peer reviewed journals, uh, follow what's required in today's scientific community, and then have information available for business owners to, or to make educated decisions based on evidence-based research, which is, which is the, which is required. And, and you know, I, when I, I go back 10 years and I think how oh, evidence-based, you know, it used to drive me crazy every time I heard that in our profession. Yeah. I'd say, because, oh, it's just uh, your clinical experience. I said, well, you know, let's both of us jump out of a, um, a plane with a pair. I'll have the parachute. You don't have the parachute. And we'll see, you know, yeah. who survives the jump. You know, what was the evidence-based research that a parachute works or doesn't work? We have millions and millions of chiropractic adjustments and clinical proof that these things work. And, and uh, there's a lot of research behind chiropractic. So when people say, oh, it's not a science, that's not accurate at all. There's a lot Agreed. of legitimate science uh, well, behind well, what we do. And one of the greatest things we do with, in, with this whole COVID-19 and, and uh, attacking our society mm -hmm. is that... Uh, we impact immunity. And yes. I know that the, the information you're sharing with the world is how, how are we impacting immunity? And, and there's a lot of research available in, in this area. I, I don't want to keep babbling on it and I don't want no, to that's uh, great. go off track, Dr. G, but, uh, but uh, becoming a researcher in these last few years is, has really opened my eyes. One is to the methodologies of research and the importance of research and the importance of peer reviewed and properly done research uh, because if you don't follow the proper scientific method, then it's, it's really not of, of high quality or of high value. And then it's ignored by the decision makers. That is a tough area. I think that's a tough area for chiropractic because it's hard to do a placebo. And if you're talking about the scientific method where we have... You basically 
we have two groups. So you have one group is your, your study group. Yeah, there's a placebo group and then there's your study well, group. Well, it's not necessarily a placebo. You, you, have, oh. you have what's called a control group. There, there you go. Yeah, so we have a, a control group and your control is the, you have the people that you treat and the people you don't treat. So it, it was, we measured these. So the, the way we did it was we analyzed 300 people mm. and not, not all 300 got treatments. But some got treatments and some didn't get treatments. So after after evaluate, we had a, a clinical evaluations. Then we had a very um, validated, strongly validated questionnaire called the work. Um, well, I just don't know if I can tell you what it is. <laughs> it's okay. called the work loss questionnaire. So WLQ, uh -huh. uh, productivity loss score. So you, you basically through these questions, they they ask you several questions that will give a very accurate uh, view of your productivity based on different things. How do you work? How do you function in the morning? Uh, physical activity, mental activity, interpersonal relationship activity, uh, re activity with clients, uh, physical things like typing, holding a phone or using machinery, et cetera. Mm -hmm. et cetera. So there's a, there's a lot of questions uh, in this questionnaire. It's uh, very highly validated throughout the scientific community. It's one of the most widely used to measure productivity interesting and so we measured productivity using this tool this instrument uh so we measured the people before treatment and then we had one group that was treated and the control group that was not treated so the the people that were not treated they're actually what they call lost productivity score mm -hmm. increased uh, over a 16 week period so when we first measured everyone uh, they had what was we came up with a 10.5 percent productivity loss. Now, if you if you multiply 10.5 percent times their annual wage uh, or monthly wage, etc., that will give you the calculation, the estimated uh, loss of productivity, and how much it costs your company. So, after 16 weeks, uh, an average of only it was very few treatments that were done because the clinics were only open two days a week. Uh, but we redid the testing and we allowed people to have between about 10, eight and 10 treatments only, okay. which is not a lot of treatments, yeah. but we did it. The reason I did that was to follow, okay, what, what's kind of standard now in the physical therapy world, what's standard in the traditional medicine world. And it isn't really a lot of treatments. So I also wanted to show that uh, chiropractic can have an impact. It doesn't need, you don't need to have hundreds of adjustments to have the impact. Well, you so don't, we, but to fix the curve you're talking about, that's going to take more than six or eight visits. Absolutely. Absolutely. So because we weren't focused on the correction of the curve, but mostly on, on productivity loss, to see if we can decrease the loss. And we dropped it from 10.5% to 1.8% wow. uh, within a short period of time. And the people that were not treated jumped on an average from 105 jumped up to 11.2%. So they actually... Wow. Because they weren't treated and they're going to work with neck pain or low back pain or whatever their issue is, carpal tunnel syndrome, shoulder pain, headaches, um, they actually, their productivity loss increased. So over that 16 week period, so between you know, that time period, the, it, we just had an amazing impact on them. They, were, they improved their awesome. productivity, their scores. Uh, were fantastic, and it, it'll it's it's funny, Jay, because as I'm talking to you, I'm trying, I'm thinking in Portuguese. It's kind of a phenomenon. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. so it's it's on beyond our expectations. Um, the results of this this research so, that is fascinating. Well, I'm going to show a clip from your website that ex briefly explains the absenteeism and the presenteeism and what that means and how this is impacted with what you've just explained, which is phenomenal. I mean. The, the study sounds great. Oh, no, we made this little video before I even did my PhD. Yeah, but it just goes, it's beautiful. And it just explains to the layperson or to the, the HR person or to the CEO, well, what is it that you are talking about? And how is this going to save us money or make us more money in our business, which is really what we should be doing, rather mm -hmm. than just thinking of, oh, how do I, how do I save expenses on, on disease care? Right. How do we proactively give more to the world and generate more jobs and generate more income. I love that proactive European thinking. You know, there's a cool phenomena right now. We, we're doing tele, teleconsults. So we're calling up the people in the companies 
Not a single one of them had cis COVID and not a single one of my patients in the private clinic also, not a single one got sick. And I do believe yeah. that we had a direct impact on their immunity and their immune systems. That's the other beautiful part where I wanna shift gears just a little bit. So we're talking about neuromusculoskeletal treatment by proactively adjusting employees at work as a perk for work. It's like you work here, this is a perk you get. You can take advantage or not take advantage. But as you showed in the research, those that take advantage are more productive, they're sick less often, fewer sick days, they're more productive while they're there. But we know, you and I know that the nervous system controls the immune system. And the immune system is fighting bacterial infections, viral infections, and even cancer every day. So with what you're doing on site at work, another perk they may not even realize is how it's boosting their immune system so they're not getting sick as often. And so I'm just gonna kind of tie this into the, the virus stuff a little bit here for just a moment in that um, back in the pandemic, and there, there are research studies that that show this, but this is where the research is different from what you're telling me, where we've got a study group and a, uh, not placebo, control. but a control group. Yeah. And then there's the research that the Asians have been doing for thousands of years, which is why, unfortunately, in the Western science, they say if it's not a double blind study or something like that, it's, it's junk science, when there is some value to just the numbers of reviewing cases of case studies. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. So that's, that's, I think, where chiropractic has been put down over the decades is like, oh, it's just a case study. It's, you know, it's, it's not a double blind study. So, sorry to pick on that, but uh, you've seen it from both sides. Because I look at this and go, okay, if I look at the numbers from back when the, we had a pandemic, a real big pandemic in, in 1918, one in 15 people were dying, but one in 866 chiropractic patients were dying from the flu back then. And they say, oh, well, it doesn't, it's not a double blind study. Well, no, but it's, we're statistically counting people up. There's value to that. So would you mind your perspective on that with the PhD and the information and training you have on that? Well, <laughs> well it's no surprise that the Spanish flu, uh, that was what you're referring to in 1918. Mm -hmm. and they just come out of World War I and then they get nailed with that. So yeah. they already imagine the amounts of stress in their lives. Yeah. There's a lot of research was done more in the 90s. And even when I was at Parker, uh, I went out down there in 1989. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a, a large cohort of AIDS patients, mm -hmm. HIV positive patients. Uh, and these guys, it was, it was mostly guys, uh, lived far longer than anybody else. So they, they, we kept tracking them, they were treating, and they're just doing normal chiropractic care, dorsals, dorsal spine alignments, adjustments, cervical spine, lumbar spine, just treating, not necessarily treating them for pain, but stimulating their immune systems. Mm -hmm. uh, based on research that was done in the 80s and 90s, uh, well, back then it was, that was what um, encouraged more schools to do research was mm -hmm. this group of AIDS patients that were just seemed to be healthier than everyone else. Mm -hmm. And what, what was the key factor that they all had was their neutrophil count. So neutrophils are white blood cells, right? So mm -hmm. uh, in fact, most of the white blood cells that, that lead the immune system's response are neutrophils. So, you know, there's four other types of white blood cells. There's neutrophil, but neutrophils are the most plentiful type, making up 55 to 70% of your white blood cell count. Mm -hmm. And white blood cells, also called leukocytes, are a key part of your immune system. And so there was research done in 1992 to showing that enhanced neutrophil respiratory bursts as a biological marker for manipulation forces. Uh, the duration of the effect and association with substance P and tumor necrosis factor. So basically what, when you stimulate the, the cervical spine and the dorsal spine, the research is showing that it had a direct impact on, on the, this production of not only of the white blood cells, but the impact on immunity. So there's, you know, there's these T helper, helper, excuse me, T helper cells. So, uh, technically called uh, CD4. So the, the study, there was another study that concluded that upper cervical adjustments increase CD4 or helper T cell counts, which initiate the body's response to viruses in HIV positive subjects uh, by 48% over a six month duration of, of the study. And this study was based and inspired by uh, these HIV patients. Uh, that several schools were doing, but when I had the honor of being there and treating some of these guys at Park, 
and they were all healthy. They seemed healthy, they looked healthy while their buddies were dying off. And uh, that just impressed me right there that there's something more to this than pain, so much more than, than pain. Yeah. And I uh, got into chiropractic, not because of pain, but because I couldn't breathe. Yeah. So it literally saved my life. But uh, sorry about the dogs. Are they yeah, coming they're across? They're coming across pretty loud, but that's all right. Yeah. But the, you know, I'm, I'm not a biochemist. You know, we, of course, we studied our biochemistry, but uh, they are research papers that are peer-reviewed, evidence-based research that done in chiropractic. There's a plethora of data available uh, on the web in these areas, and you'll find it under SMT, which, in, which, <laughs> which, well, anyway, the consequences of manipulative therapy. So. This is what the, the studies are about. So what chiropractic does is what's called a priming effect on the immune effector cells. Mm -hmm. therefore, thereby, what does it do? It, it alerts the response to uh, certain immuno, what do you call it? Immuno neuroregulatory mediators. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. a mouthful, isn't it? It is. Uh, so these, these are things that, that help boost the immune system or stimulate the immune system response. And that's simply through chiropractic adjustments. So here we're you. I don't think it's any coincidence that in 1918, that people under chiropractic care, there was a huge, I mean, that's a huge difference. Mm -hmm. so one, one in 800 and something versus one in, what was the, the number you gave? I wasn't aware. One of in 866 that were under care and one out of 15 that were not that, under that, care. That's incredible. So can you imagine? What would be going on in America right now if, you know, okay, the chiropractors put on your masks and mm -hmm. get adjusting. Yep. It would probably be much more powerful than this uh, chloroquine or something like hydrochloroquine. Yeah, the chloroquine, the vitamin C, and the zinc are very, very helpful. I mean, they're good viral nutritional things, but gosh, turning on that nervous system that's controlling your immune system is great too. I think the fear we're having in, in society today worldwide is we're concerned that somebody is going to be a carrier without symptoms and is going to get somebody else sick that has a weak immune system. But if you're a carrier with no immune system, you're a healthy individual. And that's the majority. I mean, it's still, I don't care how, what generation we live in, it's still survival of the fittest in mother nature and on planet earth. So I don't understand why we're so concerned. I mean, I'm not downplaying the care and the trying to take care of those that do have unhealthy immune systems or other health concerns that could make them more susceptible to the coronavirus. But we still got to live our lives and have the community and our communities and our income going and generate because it hurts everybody the way we're, we're doing it right now because we're afraid that healthy people are going to get sick people sick. I don't get that. <laughs> it, it's, it is frightening, Dr. J, because people that truly need care are mm. afraid. And yes. fear itself diminishes your immunity. Um, as we know, it's a stress. There's no more stress than fear on the human immune system. Yes. So. Uh, they're living in fear. They're being bombarded with horrible news every minute of every day if they turn on the TV. Mm -hmm. and, and they're being told to shelter in, in place so they're not getting any sunshine, no vitamin D. Yes. Uh, they're doing everything wrong, mm -hmm. which they should be get, you know, getting some sun and some fresh air and they should be moving their bodies and, and uh, yeah. taking deep breaths, not hiding in fear. Uh, so and that, that, that's my opinion. But yeah. I think research also validates that, that that's something that's very important and something they're missing. Uh, this economic impact, I, I mean, I don't want to get too far off your, your topics here, but yeah. I mean, this is impacting all of us financially. A lot Absolutely. of chiropractors may not reopen after this yeah. because they've been forced to shut down. And, and uh, unfortunately, not all chiropractors are the best business people, mm -hmm. nor are any physicians or people in the healthcare arena generally aren't very clever business people they're better they're great physicians they're great at helping right. people but they don't truly pay, plan ahead for uh for things like this and many, many of them may go out of business and, yeah, and that's very unfortunate because they should have remained open and, and could have been treating people safely and effectively yes. without putting themselves or anyone else at risk uh, because the risk to the healthy individuals is very very low mm -hmm. but but even so if if someone at high high risk people came in for chiropractic care you would decrease their risk so uh i think we've done all of this backwards but only time will tell yeah we'll, we'll look back on this and have a lot more data but i mean there's, there's logic there's research and then there's fear driving and pushing logic and research kind of out the window but and i appreciate your information on that because that's a 
it's not just your opinion. That's an educated opinion with 25, 26 years of skill and uh, desire in serving your community and, and the European community. And I take that with a like, very seriously what you said. So thank you for sharing that. So we, we we're talking about how this affects immune system we, in your specialty. You brought it into the workplace to help with pain and productivity and less, less pain and more productivity. But as we just talked about, those manipulations that of the spine adjusting the spine also helps boost immune system and you've seen that with research when you were going to when you were in, in dallas at the school uh, there are other research studies that i'll i'll try to pop up a list and of some of the references to some of these studies uh in editing yeah i don't want this to be, be purely chiropractic because mm -hmm. we're, we're out to serve humanity um of course, I am a chiropractor. I love the chiropractic profession, but our brothers in arms, the osteopaths, uh, uh, well, the ones here in Europe anyway, the, the ones in America have just become uh, pill-pushing medical doctors. So <laughs> they're not, there are still some out there that, that uh, there, there is research in the osteo osteopathic world. Back in the 1918, during that time, they had the similar reaction. So mm -hmm. they, they were helping people during that Spanish flu time. And if I can pull up that article, um, I have a friend who's an osteopath who sent that to me on WhatsApp. And okay. perhaps I can get that out to you. But it, it's just to show again, the focus on the spine and nervous system, in their case was the lymphatic and, and circulatory system. But we're, mm. we're all basically doing the same thing. We're freeing up interference of the body's immune systems, circulatory systems, lymphatic systems. Uh, basically freeing up any interference in the function, normal functioning of the human body. Uh, yeah. Whatever our philosophies might be a little bit different, but our outcomes are very similar. Uh, and our love for our patients and our desire to serve humanity is the same. Yeah. And so, uh, again, these other disciplines are getting similar responses and they, they are all <laughs> as frustrated as we are mm -hmm. uh, about this because they know medicine isn't the only cure, or the only way to, to resolve this. And we know from our years of experience that the human body is the best pharmacy. It's the best yeah. natural defenses. It's really probably, the, I would say, the, <laughs> the best medicine is our own body when it's free right. of interference and fed the right nutrients, et cetera. So um, not in all cases, of course, and we do need medicine to to help balance things where our body is not capable of, of fighting things on its own because of whatever reason. Mm -hmm. uh, but we know for a fact that the chiropractic stimulates the immune system. I mean, we, we could go on and on about that, but th there's more research articles that I can reference, et cetera. But I think the point is made um, because I don't know if your audience is, is, are not biochemists, they may not know what I'm talking about because, uh, there's, I, I'll just share something that, mm -hmm. that you and I both know that, that spinal manipulation generates a force over a certain threshold, which mm -hmm. elicits what's called viscerosomatic responses. And what that does is that has an effect on both neutrophils and mononuclear cells or phagocytic activity. And what, is, what are phagocytes? They go and eat up the, they're the, the troopers that go out and kill the bad guys, right? So, right. Uh, so we show, we've shown through research and through studies in the early 90s that, that chiropractic adjustments do that, at least over the short term. But if you're frequently being adjusted, then it's going to do that over the long term. So that, that was what led to this uh, increase in the, the helper T-cell counts. Um, and that's no small thing, especially now, I think that we have an opportunity to educate the public that chiropractic care has a direct impact on immunity and it's not hearsay <laughs> it's right. not conspiracy theory yeah <laughs> it's absolutely a, uh, it's something that we can focus on and educate our patients and let them make an educated choice based on evidence-based research that's widely available on the internet fantastic if, and if you want to turn your video on again for just a little bit i want to have some parts where we go back and forth with a little bit of video of you i want to scare anyone <laughs> You're fine. So.